Good morning or good afternoon, however the case may be. It's uh, good to be with everybody, at least virtually today. Uh, hopefully my audio is uh, working better than our, than our host was. It was a, a little spotty, but uh, uh, let us know if, if, if that's an issue. So I, I'm delighted to chat with you all today. In terms of disclosures, I really don't have any that are uh, terribly relevant for today. Uh, I am an author of the Texas Functional Living Scale that's published by Pearson. I've received uh, funding uh, from different uh, sources, uh, consult uh, with some uh, attorneys as well as uh, professional sports teams. Uh, but really, uh, NIH is, is the major disclosure today since they, they funded uh, some of the research on which uh, this was based. So, of course, as everybody well knows and at this point in time, what telemedicine and telehealth actually is, providing uh, routine services at a distance. Um, keep in mind there are a variety of um, different communication media that can be used for this. Uh, we're going to be focusing today largely on video conference because that seems to be that everybody's in, we're, it's like the Zoom era now, so we're all getting used to this and many are used to it. And Some of us, I think, are still adapting. Uh, I'll be focusing on that today, but we do want to keep in mind there are other aspects and in, in, in other communication media too. So telehealth is, is growing tremendously, uh, as, as you all know, uh, due to a, a, just a variety of, of reasons. Uh, obviously, the pandemic has created an immediate and acute need for this. Uh, so it's, it's just blossomed in, in recent uh, months, really, since the pandemic started. Uh, prior to that, um, it had been used in telepsychology, telepsychiatry, and telemental health. Uh, and it's really kind of a natural environment for face-to-face -face, uh, contact uh, using verbal communication. It's a, a little less uh, uh, well-suited to certain um, assessment modalities that we engage in. But when we uh, looked at the number of telemental or telehealth publications back in 2013, uh, you see down in the, the lower right there, there were only two in neuropsychology. Uh, they, it was really led by radi teleradiology and telepathology. We did an update of this uh, in 2018 and found the, the basically the number of telehealth references had doubled. Uh, the neuropsychology, as of last night, there were 27 uh, listed on PubMed, which is a dramatic increase, still not as high as it probably should be and is going to be uh, as the publications uh, continue to come out now. If you look at the telepsychology, telepsychiatry evidence, uh, most of the studies reported very, very similar uh, outcomes as traditional face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, it's been well accepted by patients and families, uh, seem to be a very reasonable alternative. We'll talk more about some uh, updates along these lines. In the earliest days, um, some of the providers didn't feel it uh, allowed them adequate um, ability to really connect with people or really uh, evaluate um, some of their aspects of nonverbal behaviors, nonverbal cues. Uh, so they were actually a little bit less satisfied with it than, than patients and families were. So one thing, I, before we jump into the video conference uh, arena, I, I do want to remind people, don't forget the telephone. Uh, there are tests developed for telephone use specifically, mostly cognitive, brief cognitive screening tools. Uh, in fact, we just uh, published a, uh, one of my uh, former fellows published a really nice uh, review of the literature uh, in archives uh, just uh, this last month. And uh, that provides a really nice overview of a lot of the uh, instruments that we could find that have been used in the telephone environment because a lot of the same tests that work in the phone and work in video conference and vice versa. So, and, and we are using telephone aspects of, of screening, which I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later. So as, as everybody has seen, uh, uh, what does your video conference uh, setup look like? This was our original setup, which had a, uh, keep in mind, this was in a research setting. So we actually had a mobile camera in, in the remote site. Um, and it, it was a little easier in some respects to control the environment, obviously, than some of the in-home things that are being done now, which we will uh, address toward the end of the talk today. But briefly, uh, in the early days, there, was, there were concerns about uh, you know, having adequate uh, and fast enough visual and audio connections. Still today on some of the calls that we're all on, you'll hear that certain people's voices will cut out from time to time. Well, obviously that can be a big challenge if you're administering 
a, a verbal attention test or a verbal memory test if they're not adequately hearing you. Um, obviously, additional factors include monitor size and whatnot. Uh, and then importantly is how do you look on camera? Uh, and even those of us who are not particularly uh, vain, you do need to pay attention to that. Uh, for example, how do you want to look? Do you want to look like a, a floating head uh, in your office, a floating head in a study? Um, do you want to have your head chopped off? Uh, or do you want to have a bright background behind you where they really can't, it's like a mystery person talking to you? And of course, uh, you got to watch your own uh, your own behaviors during these uh, engagements as well. Uh, if you get frustrated, you need to be careful how you're looking. And if you're checking your cell phone uh, during that, you just be wary of where you're checking it. And of course, always avoid the "that's just too much information." I'm too close to you uh, view as you look carefully at something on the screen. You do want to also consider what is in your background. So for example, do you want people knowing what aspects of your home uh, environment look like? And the last one is obviously a caveat. You know, be careful where you're doing the, uh, the telehealth visit from as well. There's certain things we just want to avoid. And hopefully a few of you got a chuckle out of that. So one thing I really miss about these interactions is the audience responses or lack thereof uh, as, as appropriate. Um, so what we're trying to do, obviously, is to recreate a traditional testing environment, but doing it virtually. Um, so uh, there's a lot of things we need to think about. Depending upon your approach to these assessments is, do you need for the patient or the subject at the remote end to have materials? Do they have to write something? Um, are you going to need any assistance with with that particular patient uh, during the, the evaluation or in the case of an emergency? So the good news for us as neuropsychologists is that many of the tests involve question answer responses, and we don't need a lot of equipment for some of our tests. So the question still comes up, which tests can be done uh, via video conference and which ones shouldn't be done or which ones require modification. As I've done a number of uh, talks on this topic, I, I always get uh, people uh, kind of sharing what they have done and how they have adapted tests or testing procedures to this environment. And, Sometimes uh, they, they, it sounds like it's really a major, major break from standard administration. So you just have to be very mindful of how far you're getting away from, if, if at all, the traditional standard uh, assessment. Because obviously this may have an impact on reliability, uh, the validity of what you're trying to uh, evaluate. So uh, years ago, we took on these questions of what tests work, what norms can you use, and also what populations are suitable or maybe unsuitable for this type of evaluation. When we first did a peek at this literature back in 2005, 2006, there were only a handful of studies, uh, but most were encouraging using brief cognitive screening tests with uh, studies uh, really demonstrating similar results, whether they did it face-to-face -face or via remote uh, testing. Uh, most of them did use brief tasks. Uh, the sample sizes and the designs really varied quite widely. And, and it, although the general sense obviously was that all were uh, quite supportive. Our first publication in this area uh, used a, a brief battery of tests in small groups of patients with and without cognitive impairment. And our results too, in, in using a uh, counterbalanced uh, design with alternate forms, showed good test, uh, retest reliability, uh, regardless of, of test condition and environment, which really uh, led us to uh, pursue a, a larger uh, study some of you have, may have seen. Uh, we eventually published uh, at the conclusion of the NIH uh, R01 uh, in 2014. And uh, so we wanted to use tests. This was, so I, I should say, this is really uh, focusing on tests uh, in uh, aging uh, uh, individuals. Uh, I, I will talk about some of our child work uh, later on, but most of this first part is, is about adult assessment. So we, uh, our aims were to evaluate how does, how does it even work in this environment? Do you need somebody at the remote site helping you with patients with a mild cognitive impairment or even early stage dementia? And then do different populations perform differently, whether they're rural or urban, um, whether they have cognitive impairment or not, 
Um, we actually have a uh, satellite, had a satellite clinic for our Alzheimer's disease center at UT Southwestern in Tallahena, Oklahoma. So we actually had a really nice sample of American Indians as well. So we wanted to see how these tests would perform across these different populations. So our research uh, setup, uh, as you can see here, had a mobile camera. Uh, the examiner is in the, uh, the panel on the left. The patient is on the right. So the patient can actually uh, see the stimuli. We tried to make the stimuli appear to be roughly the same size to them uh, as we would have them uh, in person. The examiner can see themselves and how they're coming across, how the stimuli look, and they can also see the patient. And then the cam camera is mobile. So if you are having them uh, do some sort of written or drawing test, you could actually uh, uh, change the angle of the camera to see what they're doing. So we had uh, basically a couple hundred subjects, different categories, cognitively impaired and non-impaired uh, across different groups. Our battery included the mini mental, the Hopkins, uh, digit span, letter fluency, category fluency, short form Boston, and the clock drawing. We had a few other tests that we uh, we uh, also administered, but this was the core of the of the kind of aging or, or dementia battery uh, that is. Uh, these tests are commonly used in the literature. Again, as I mentioned, we used alternate forms, counterbalanced fashion, uh, and we did want it to be brief because that, that's a really important point about. Um, telemedicine or telehealth um, evaluations. Uh, we really try to keep our evals uh, as, as brief as possible. Um, and uh, test selection is obviously uh, e even more important, uh, which we can discuss later too. So our initial sample had a couple hundred subjects uh, between uh, cognitively impaired and intact. Um, nice balance of uh, male to female. They were uh, a little above average education wise, but it was a wide age uh, and education range. The uh, testing time, our goal was to keep it under 45 minutes. So on average, we did that. Uh, as you'll see, we had, we had one uh, patient uh, with dementia who took uh, about an hour and a half, so twice the normal amount of time. Um, but that person also took uh, you know, almost 75, 74 minutes uh, when they were tested face-to-face -face also. So it, it was quite a range, but on average, uh, it, it, it worked pretty well and kept in our time frame. Uh, just to review those results, uh, the mini mental showed a very, very strong correlation, uh, intraclass correlations of 0.9 uh, between the face-to-face -face and the telemedicine uh, test administration. Uh, looking at our language measures, uh, saw uh, generally very strong correlations, uh, 0.7 and up, uh, and then no significant differences when you looked at the mean values between the groups, uh, whether they're being done uh, via face-to-face -face or telemedicine. The video conference are in the lighter bars and the face-to-face -face traditional testing is in the dark blue. Same with our uh, digispan and uh, clock drawing uh, results. A little bit lower uh, uh, reliability scores uh, for digispan. Uh, that's something we that's been reported in other studies as well, uh, but still uh, very significant and, and no significant differences between test conditions on, on average. When we look at the Hopkins uh, verbal learning test across the learning trials, you see parallel lines that are very, very close between the video conference and face-to-face -face conditions. Likewise, for delayed recall and recognition discriminability when you add those to the first three learning trials. So really suggesting with an ICC of 0.8 that you're getting pretty much the, similar, the same results whether you're testing in a video conference or face-to-face uh, -face, uh, uh, test uh, administration. So um, we also looked at the R bands in this way, just to expand the studies we were working on. Um, and that last, the last slide, uh, that was all from our uh, GINS paper in 2014, I, for, I neglected to mention, um, that were, uh, those initial results from that uh, pilot battery were, were published. And then we also wanted to look at the, the R bands. Um, and this was a smaller sample. Um, so for those of you that are uh, maybe getting into research now, uh, come up with all your good ideas at the beginning of your study and don't come up with all of them later because you can only add things later and your sample size will be smaller. So we ended up with a smaller sample of our band's participants, but we got the same results basically, showing uh, very similar results, whether they were tested in face-to-face -face, um, or uh, the uh, telemedicine uh, testing condition using alternate uh, forms of the R bands. 
when we looked at the results just specifically to our American Indian subjects, uh, we also uh, found uh, very similar results, uh, intraclass correlations in the same range uh, with an average of about 0.8. So it looked like it, it worked quite well in this uh, subpopulation as well. Um, we then wanted to look at the validity. Uh, so uh, obviously, the, you know, reliability uh, obviously needs to be demonstrated, but so does validity. So we actually did a, a, a study uh, in, uh, published in the archives uh, a couple of years ago that uh, one of some of my graduate students worked at the time. They're now they're now doctors, uh, but uh, I was very proud of the work they did on this. And that was simply to answer the question. If you administer these tests in a face-to-face -face condition, how well do they distinguish impaired versus non-impaired? And then do the results differ when you administer them via video teleconference? Do you get the same uh, degree of, of differentiation or separation between groups? And the good news is that you do. Um, you, we saw very, very similar scores between the, uh, the healthy controls, the unimpaired and the impaired, whether they were tested in the face-to-face -face, uh, conditions, that's the uh, the first uh, two columns, or the televideo conference uh, condition, that's the second two columns. Uh, so very, very similar results uh, and nice ability to distinguish impaired from non-impaired with no significant differences uh, across uh, the uh, different test administration modalities. So we showed that it's it's feasible and actually we did not use support at the far end uh, aside from having someone to check the patient in uh, we had a mini mental one uh, patient who was uh, i think below a 15 um, and uh, she at one point uh, just decided i think she had enough or she got forgot what she was doing but she got really really close to the to the camera and and said well this has been fun and she just she left um, so uh, it, it can happen. There are there are limitations uh, with this. You don't have obviously the ability to uh, uh, build quite the same rapport, if you will, or, or maintain that contact. If somebody's going to leave my office, I could probably talk them into staying, as opposed to the, if they're you know in another setting and they can just get up and leave. I don't have a lot of control over that. Uh, so we uh, anyway the uh, initial results were, were quite promising. And then uh, very proud of uh, Lana Harder's work uh, and colleagues uh, here at UT Southwestern with a recent publication uh, from a group of kids that were actually tested in their homes. Uh, these were uh, pediatric demyelinating disorders uh, uh, patients, uh, a little bit smaller sample, and uh, they were tested in their home as well as in the clinic uh, with a standard uh, battery of tests that are commonly used. Uh, this study did require uh, some of the uh, stimuli to be uh, mailed to them and mailed back uh, so that it wasn't a completely uh, remote uh, assessment without any sort of additional interaction. Um, and it included uh, these measures, including the CDLT, digits, uh, symbol digit modalities, uh, BERI, DCAFs, and the Woodcock-Johnson. Uh, took a different statistical approach to this uh, using regression analyses um, and found... Uh, uh, actually, before I re report the results, um, uh, Dr. Harder kept really, really detailed notes of what was happening during during the uh, during the process, such if there was any interruption whatsoever that was recorded. Um, some of the evals were done on a computer, some were done on an iPad or tablet. Did not allow cell phones. That's really not a good idea for most of our tests. Um, unless you're taking the more of a telephone testing approach for the for uh, different measures. Um, they did report, we did find that there was, a, in about 40% of cases, there was some sort of environmental distraction, but that could have been as minor as, as, as a patient briefly looking away, uh, might have been a, a dog barking, uh, you know, a cat walking across behind the patient. Uh, so there was some sort of potential distractor, but it was it was not felt to be significant in very many of those cases at all. Uh, less than 1% were, were felt to have actually interrupted the testing process. And that's really important. Even when doing a clinical evaluation uh, in this modality, you do want to make sure you note when uh, interruptions of some sort uh, occur. But then you as a clinician obviously have to be very careful to, um, to evaluate whether or not you think that had a likely effect on the actual test result. Because 
Uh, a lot of things uh, really don't. You know, our tests are pretty robust. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those tips uh, a little bit later as well. So there was no uh, significant effect of test modality uh, and the scores, uh, there was no effect uh, over time either. And this was actually one of the first published uh, child uh, neuropsych telehealth assessment uh, studies and also one of the first to be done in, in patients' homes. This was part of a research project, and there's some other, uh, other publications that have uh, started to come out since then. If we look at the overall uh, evidence for uh, tests administered in the video teleconference environment, uh, it's a growing list. Uh, this is a, a partial list at this point. Um, still a lot of people use it for more cognitive screening and, and brief tests. Uh, but you can see we uh, were able to assess a variety of cognitive domains. I think we're probably still weakest in the executive function outside of the, uh, the, the few measures uh, that have uh, shown promise uh, in, in that area. In the uh, Brearley et al. Uh, meta-analysis of the literature back in 2017, um, they found that there were no significant uh, differences in a test performance uh, across studies published to date, whether they were administered in video teleconference or face-to-face. -face. Uh, of the 79 scores, face-to-face uh, -face produced a slightly higher score than video teleconference in about two-thirds, uh, and then they were absolutely equal in about 6%. Uh, the little graph on, on, on the right side of the figure uh, shows which uh, tests leaned in favor of face-to-face of -face versus teleconference. Uh, and there were no significant differences overall. Um, also, a recent publication in TCN by uh, Mara and uh, Bowers and colleagues uh, in looking at just the evidence for uh, video conference assessment in aging and older adults uh, reviewed uh, these findings uh, with these tests having the most um, demonstrated reliability and validity administered in this fashion. Uh, again, with uh, you know very encouraging uh, conclusions. So one of the questions uh, that people ask is, can we use or how can we use standard test norms in this video conference environment? Well, the, of the study of the test study to date, we t seem to get this very very similar results regardless of test condition. So the implication is, if you can get the same result, we ought to be able to use the same norms, right? Um, Obviously, we have to apply these a little bit cautiously, especially if you're in a non-standard environment. Uh, so my analogy, if you're testing patients in their homes or in a remote setting that you don't have control over, um, sort of approach it uh, like you're doing an in-hospital evaluation for those of you that conduct those. Uh, so when I'm doing a consult on a patient in the hospital, you know, there, there might be people opening the door, uh, you know, the staff coming in for other procedures. There might be, you know, uh, sounds of uh, bells going off or, you know, whatever, depending upon the unit you're on. And uh, obviously those sort of interaction, those sort of potential interruptions may adversely impact test results on occasion, but it's been, it's my experience over the years that that's fairly uncommon, quite honestly, to where I feel like something clearly uh, destroyed the validity of the of the test I'm giving. And if it does, I will use another test a, a little bit later and try to recapture that. Um, but a, a lot of the minor things that may interfere or be seen as an interference may not actually uh, significantly uh, interrupt your testing. I'm always amazed in our clinic uh, at, at uh, UT Southwestern, we had construction going on uh, in, the, in the basement of the building for a while. And uh, the, the clinicians and the psychometrists, we were all very, very concerned that this noise is just going to, you know, kill off our evaluations and uh, annoy our patients uh, for that week that that was going on for. So we, we kind of adjusted our schedule and, and did it. Uh, uh, we adapted a, a, a less of a rigorous schedule, shall, shall we say. We cut back the number of patients. And uh, we, we also did exit interviews with people and uh, even prior to uh, the evaluation being over with, we asked about their experience and whether these things interfered. And uh, about half the patients said they didn't even notice the noise. So uh, we as clinicians were much more sensitive to it than the patients were. But obviously uh, an important uh, reminder here is that the tests and the norms are no better than the clinician using them. So 
this is a really kind of a new frontier we're into with this video conference assessment. Um, but we are still the clinicians uh, and we depend a lot upon our test and test results. Um, but in, in the end, we are the interpreting mechanism, if you will. So how do patients respond to this? There's only been a few studies uh, that have actually looked at this. One is uh, a study I did with some graduate students when we were uh, first uh, doing the R01 uh, larger study. We took a subsample and did some satisfaction ratings uh, in, our, in our population. We found that most people were quite satisfied with it. Uh, they felt it was easy to understand. They weren't concerned about privacy. Um, and about two thirds of them said they really uh, had no strong preference uh, for the test condition. Uh, about a third said they preferred the face-to-face -face interaction with an actual examiner in the room, but then 10% uh, said they preferred the, uh, the video conference. They felt a little bit, a bit, little bit uh, less anxious and they felt like the video conference uh, was more fun uh, in, in some of the cases. Um, about a third of our uh, uh, volunteers said it was easier to communicate when they were face-to-face -face in the room with somebody. Uh, and then importantly, it was interesting that 15% uh, felt they were a little bit less nervous. They didn't feel that they would have felt as pressured when they were doing it um, with the remote video conference environment. And uh, in terms of acceptability to patients with, cognitive, with and without cognitive impairment, we actually got very similar results. Uh, we uh, asked our patients uh, whether they preferred the in-person uh, assessment, the video conference assessment, or if they had no preference. And as you can see in these in these bars here, about two thirds, uh, half to two thirds said that they really had no preference. Um, and a number of each group actually preferred the in-person evaluation, about a fourth of the unimpaired people, about a third of the, of the impaired. Um, interesting to note, none of the impaired patients actually reported that they preferred the video conference environment, though. So there are, there are some inherent limitations. And it's, it's, it's novel, although in, in this day and age, now that we're months into the uh, pandemic, it's less novel than it was uh, certainly years ago. In the pediatric study, uh, Lana Harder's group also uh, did a satisfaction survey. And again, the majority felt it was quite acceptable. And similar to the results, uh, most, uh, you know, half to two thirds said they really didn't have a strong preference. And there was a subgroup that actually preferred the tele teleconference, uh, but it was also uh, acceptable. And, and I, I did add this caveat that these data are, the satisfaction data are, are pre-COVID. Uh, so it, it may be higher now uh, that patients are getting used to seeing uh, perhaps all of their doctors or many of their doctors uh, video, via video conference. So the initial uh, research, and it's growing as you can see, uh, is really, really very supportive of this as an assessment uh, medium on both sides uh, of, the, of the testing desk, if you will. Examiners report that it works uh, reasonably well and uh, patients are satisfied with it. And, uh, Actually, uh, Dr. Laura LaCritz has headed up a satisfaction survey with the with our telemedicine uh, results in our clinic. And, and again, it's been very, very uh, supportive findings. Uh, some of the research that was done uh, years ago, obviously these were volunteer subjects. Uh, these were standardized conditions. So uh, using brief you know, uh, evaluations um, and we did have help available if we needed it. Um, so it's, uh, you know, we need to make sure that we're trying to make the in-home assessments as uh, clinic-like as possible. Uh, but of course, it's a different environment. Uh, so if we look at this, uh, this young lady being uh, tested, she's on her iPhone. Uh, I think she's holding up to her right ear. Uh, she's on an iPad. What could possibly go wrong in this assessment condition? Again, I'm hoping there's some audience uh, chuckles out of this. Uh, she's not only facing a window, at a sewing machine, she's got a dog in her lap. I mean, there are just, just so many things. It's like, this is like uh, the easy take home version of where's Waldo. It's like, what's wrong with this assessment uh, environment? Obviously not all tests have been uh, studied in the tele environment and it isn't quite the same. Um, I mentioned earlier, brief assessments are generally recommended. Don't forget the telephone. Uh, I always encourage everybody to, to try this out, try it out on, on, on friends even, our colleagues, uh, 
before you actually uh, go live with patients if you haven't done that already. You can see we got this, uh, this young lady uh, fixed up here at her kitchen table, uh, free of uh, distractions, and she's gonna do much better on her tests, uh, as, we all, as we all know. Um, so obviously, there are a variety of issues that come up with testing in the home, including test security issues. Um, and uh, Pearson has some great information uh, about this on their website as well. Uh, maintaining standardization, of course, um, and ensuring that you're not misinterpreting or over or under interpreting your data. I've seen some reports uh, over the last few months uh, from other, other uh, practices that um, where the clinician essentially says they give their impressions, but then they basically say, but it was all done via telemedicine. We don't know how this is gonna affect the results. And they essentially wash away all of their impressions. So uh, my reaction would be, what is the referral person thinking in getting that report? If they say, well, it looks like a dementia, but then your next paragraph says, yeah, but I really couldn't tell because of all these other factors. So. Uh, we need to make sure that we're being helpful to our referring uh, docs. And if you're not getting valid data, you need to do something about it, or you need to you know, curtail the exam, go with the screening, and give the feedback based on that. There have been a number of uh, practice recommendations published over the years. Uh, I was uh, pleased that one of my graduate students led, the, led this effort years ago. Uh, the IOPC, uh, the Interorganizational Practice Committee, uh, has published some uh, really nice uh, uh, work uh, this this year. Uh, so I encourage people to look that up uh, as a good reference. And some of that is very, very detailed in terms of kind of how to do it uh, in, in practice. Um, to summarize the IOPC's areas that they touched on, they really included uh, a really comprehensive array of, uh, of issues running from informed consent, uh, choosing a platform, uh, obviously, uh, threats to validity, and then uh, you know considerations for in-person testing too. So that's a that's a really a terrific resource. In addition to the others that are out there, one of the things that uh, uh, Karen Postal led the way on was uh, a nice. Uh, they had a nice graph in this one from the IOPC, um, kind of evaluating on a continuum, uh, helping to stratify patient risk during the pandemic situation. What's the urgency of care? Uh, what's their symptom acuity? What's the, the urgency of the need of the evaluation? For example, a lot of neuropsych evaluations may not be urgent per se, uh, but we do have a, a number that uh, need to be done in a timely fashion. If a patient's uh, gonna be coming in for uh, neurosurgery, for epilepsy, for example, or deep brain stimulation, uh, in, implantation, um, those patients need to have a neuropsych evaluation done before and or after those procedures as well. So there are some cases or in the cases of, of concussion that may need to be seen more acutely as well. Um, considering the incremental validity of, of the tests, what tests can I do if I see them in the clinic versus what tests am I more restricted to do um, via video conference? And then there are the health risks uh, of the COVID-19 virus in, for the patient as well as for the examiner that have to be uh, considered as well. So there's a lot of factors that go into this. Um, so there are certain guidelines and factors uh, to think about what is the level of risk and safety that need to be provided for you and or the patient. If it's someone who's elderly with pre-existing health conditions, that certainly argues more for a home telehealth uh, type of evaluation, as opposed to someone who is, is uh, not having those health risks, is younger, is not in a higher risk category. They may uh, be very, very suitable for an in-office assessment with uh, obviously uh, current you know, uh, protective uh, gear and procedures and, and, uh, and obviously hygiene procedures, uh, sterilization, uh, making sure the airflow is good and all those things. So in our clinic, just to give an example, uh, our university converted quickly to telepractice, and that included teleneuropsychology. Right now, we're over 90% of uh, back to uh, our usual caseload as we were pre-COVID. Our psychiatry service is actually seeing more patients now, uh, still a blend of uh, in-person as well as telehealth. Um, 
we're using a staged approach. We see a lot of our patients in the clinic now with protective procedures, distancing, plexiglass, uh, face shields, masks uh, in, in place. Um, and we are doing in-clinic hybrid evaluations too, where an interview might be done face-to-face -face, uh, with the masks and shields uh, on, on the patient as well as the examiner. Uh, but we also still use telemedicine in the clinic. So they'll just be a uh, patient in one room uh, interacting with an examiner in another room, but still in the clinic ses session. And we're doing virtually all of our feedbacks uh, via telehealth now, and that is going really, really well. Uh, we're actually looking at the patient satisfaction ratings, and that, those have been really high as well. So many places uh, are using an initial phone call, obviously, to set up an in-home or telehealth visit, uh, just to ensure that they've got uh, the right equipment, that it works, they have connectivity. Um, and then some people are using cognitive screening tests like we reviewed uh, earlier uh, in reference to the Carlu article, uh, using a telephone cognitive screen that might be useful to help you gauge what tests are, are gonna be most appropriate uh, and also help uh, gauge uh, whether you feel like they may need to be seen in person versus remotely as well. There may be hearing issues that just don't work via telemedicine, for example. Uh, and then at that point, they can be, uh, they can be scheduled for uh, whichever evaluation you, you feel is uh, most appropriate. So in terms of the practical considerations, uh, there's, as I mentioned, uh, the IOPC has published this. Pearson has some really nice guidelines uh, that are very practical. Uh, uh, for testing uh, in, in the clinic as well as uh, using these remotely in, in home as well. Um, and these are general guidelines, of course. Uh, there are things to be considered in the, in the pre-session. Uh, obviously, uh, utilizing uh, screening and triage procedures, as I mentioned, uh, determining if the patient's appropriate, um, the patient and or the family's familiarity with the technology, making sure it works, it doesn't always work. And even if you do a, a call the day before, verify that everything works with the caregiver or the, uh, the uh, parent. Uh, the day of the actual eval, things may not work. The patient may not be able to understand it fully or it comes to find out they show up and they just want to use their cell phone or they're out of uh, their internet. They didn't pay the bill and it's being cut off that day. Um, needing to make sure uh, just a variety of details uh, are, occur in that initial uh, uh, pre-session visit. Uh, and obviously, if you're using physical materials that need to be sent to them, those need to be uh, sent in advance, and you need to have plans for how do you get them back also. Uh, so this is actually, uh, these are some uh, uh, pre-session instructions that are on the Pearson website. I have the reference down below that I thought were really nicely done. Just some pieces of advice about uh, things to actually say uh, to patients, like reminding them to turn off their radios, turn off their, uh, make sure the cell phone is on silent. Uh, you know, make sure that people are going to be out of the room during the evaluation. If you have to have a dog, it probably shouldn't be in the room at the time. Um, and you want, uh, you know, drinks and food to be moved away also. You know, you don't want to have in the middle of your, your evaluation the patient knocking over their coffee and spilling all over thing, and that also spoils your, your evaluation. Uh, and then, you know, uh, recommendations about lighting and seating, I thought were, were really, uh, really well done. Um, and then some really practical things uh, that sometimes uh, some of us don't even think about, but, you know, make sure they've got their computer plugged in or that it's fully charged. Uh, and that their internet is working, obviously, and that they know how to do it, and that they know how to contact you in the case there, there's a problem. Um, I think we've gone over most of these things. Uh, I always suggest, it's not always feasible, but beginning and ending the session with, your, with a contact in the, in the remote setting, especially if it's, a, if it's a minor, and making sure you have a phone number, or they have your phone number in case there is a disruption. You need to make sure you've got a, a backup plan uh, in case the connection is lost, because that is always possible. In fact, when I'm doing these webinars, I always worry at some point um, as I'm talking and talking, uh, you know, did the video cut off, you know, 10 minutes ago and have I been talking to myself for the last 10 minutes? Hopefully that's not the case today. Um, we talked about some of the environmental uh, things that are important. Um, I do encourage uh, you to have the 
patient, show them, show the examiner what's in their environment. Well, show me around your room. Uh, and then you can identify things that may be distracting or potential problems as well. Um, having them in, put a sticky note on the door that says, do not disturb. Um, some patients find it useful and less distracting to have headphones if they have them available. Um, even uh, talking with them about whether they want to be able to see themselves on the screen, it's, it can be somewhat distracting if they can see themselves in some cases. Um, obviously, making sure you can see as much of the, the patient uh, as, as possible. It's ideal if you could see their, their face as well as their hands, if you, especially if you're having a new drawing task, you might have, them have to have them angle their camera for certain uh, tasks. And then making sure that they're in an environment where the testing is feasible. Um, you don't want to have the patient on their iPad in the bathtub, for example, for a lot of different reasons, actually. So Pearson offers uh, uh, recommendations for uh, uh, what the examiner and the patient uh, uh, setting areas and uh, accessibility uh, for the uh, offices uh, might be, uh, having uh, maybe two computer monitors available to the examiner. Um, you could even have a, an additional cell phone cam uh, set up if, if you uh, arrange that ahead of time to definitely see more of the patient behaviors during the evaluation. Um, and they have some really good information uh, along those lines on their website. So then throughout the session, um, it's important to, uh, to, for you to record problems along the way uh, so that you can go back and, and make sure that if you get a particularly low score, for example, on a test, well, was that when that the postman came to the door? Is that when they were distracted by the uh, the pet coming through the room or what was going on uh, that might have really genuinely distracted them? And then you have to figure out, as I gave that example earlier, of how to incorporate that in your results. Uh, you might feel like you've got an underestimate if there was an interruption, uh, but you also need to determine uh, in, in all likelihood, do you probably have a reasonably valid assessment of, of that patient or is it really, uh, or is it really uh, not valid at all? And then you have to figure out how to deal with that. Uh, but carefully addressing those things in your report uh, is certainly important. As you're wrapping up the session, uh, usually that, it's usually good to get the, uh, the assistant caregiver uh, person uh, to check in, basically, let them know if things are done, how it went. If you sent them uh, materials, got to make sure you get them back. Uh, and then uh, tell them what's going to happen next, obviously, in terms of you know, what you're planning for feedback. Are you going to provide any venom there, or is it going to be uh, something that you arrange after you have more of a time to uh, look at your results? So in terms of uh, future directions for teleneuropsychology, obviously one of the important ones is that uh, you know everybody needs to be pushing for continued uh, coverage uh, for these uh, services uh, from the insurance carriers. Um, I still think there's room for more research uh, demonstrating the uh, feasibility of in-home evaluations using different measures. And importantly, it's an opportunity for new test development. I know, uh, Dean Dellis is working on some very creative ideas uh, with Pearson along those lines uh, for some tasks, and we look forward to seeing those. But we also look forward uh, to other, uh, others with unique uh, uh, ideas for new measures. Uh, how do we better utilize this technology to enhance assessment? Rather than this technology being something we have to work around, how can we actually uh, grab the bull by the horns and essentially run with this idea? Um, one point, uh, there was a, a paper published uh, last year by Brearley's group uh, where they actually compared the NIH toolbox, which is a computerized battery put out by the NIH uh, some years ago that's used in a lot of research settings in particular. Um, they administered it uh, with uh, an, an iPad versus a computer, and they actually found that the iPad versus the web-based scores uh, were generally correlated, but not for all of the subtests. So some of the subtests were a little bit different when administered via iPad. So um, their conclusion was that for some tasks, we might actually need separate norms uh, for certain measures administered uh, with certain uh, devices. So that's just an important caveat to, to keep in mind. Um, we do feel the, the good news, this can bring our specialized services to uh, perhaps rural and underserved populations. 
Um, some of the existing technologies uh, that Pearson is offering, like QGlobal, are certainly a step in the right direction. This is still in its early adoption stages, this overall uh, teleneuropsychology movement, if you will. Um, even though there have been a number of webinars like this and others uh, that have talked about this, uh, there's still people out there that are just giving this a shot and, and, and really asking for a lot of advice on how to do it, what it would do. But I did want to brag for a, for a moment. Well, we have reached a major milestone, though, because you really know your things are big, not, not necessarily when you get it a paper published in the top neuropsych journal, but when you get cited in a place on Wikipedia, then we know we're real, right? That's almost as big as it, you know, having read it on Facebook. Um, so uh, uh, teleneuropsychology has arrived. Um, there are a lot of different great resources uh, for teleneuropsychology and telemental health, telehealth in general. Uh, I mentioned the IOPC, APA's got uh, good information. Um, uh, the AS uh, PPB guidelines uh, have been uh, published as well, the American Telemedicine. And of course, uh, Pearson has some really nice assessment telepractice resources uh, that are online and read readily available. Where do we, I think this is going? I don't see this stopping or slowing down anytime soon. Um, I think that teleneuropsychology is only going to grow uh, in its acceptance and, uh, and utilization uh, for the years to come, perhaps, um, I mean, pending other factors. Um, but uh, for example, there, uh, there are you know, robotic uh, tools and instruments that can be used uh, in hospitals or at a sideline. Uh, Bert Vargas uh, published a paper some years ago looking at a sideline robot for concussion assessment. It's essentially a mobile iPad, uh, but it's just cool that it's on a little robot. Um, and then some of these devices can actually look more like things you, you would interact with as opposed to uh, the floating head of an, an examiner on an iPad uh, cruising around the hospital. Um, I think we're looking at more research opportunities and uh, new test development, more interactive features where we can hopefully someday get real-time feedback and test results uh, as we're working with patients in uh, in, in conducting our evaluations. I would like to be able to see my patient on the screen. I'd like to be able to see what they're seeing. I'd like to get their test results printed out on a nice little sidebar for me so that I can give feedback right away too. Um, and I, I think these things are, are possible. It does take uh, for some thinking outside the box and capitalization on technology. With that, I think we have exactly 10 minutes left, uh, according to my clock, uh, that will open things up for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Cullen. It was a wonderful review and so much really good information. I think that's super helpful. I have one question for you. Well, I have a lot of questions for you, actually. Um, but before we begin, somebody has asked if you could put the slide back up with the list of telephone cognitive screening measures, kind of close oh. to the beginning. Yes. And then I'll just ask some of the questions. They're not really related to that slide, but but just so that people can see that again. Sure. I also want to remind people that um, this will cut off right at the top of the hour. That's the way this platform works. And I just want to remind you that if you don't get your question answered, please put the question in the box that will show up after the platform closes. There will be an evaluation box. And if you put your question there, then we can get you an answer. So with that said, let me ask some of the questions. <clears throat> um, just starting off, are there certain conditions you feel more comfortable diagnosing by remote, by complete remote testing only? Similarly, are there certain conditions that you would be more hesitant to do so in? Things, uh, conditions that you would like to do face-to-face -face test at least once. This person wrote that they were thinking about diagnoses such as LD or ADHD, anxiety and depression as examples. Yeah, and I think those are some good examples. I think. You know, uh, you know, a good detailed interview for ADHD, learning disability, uh, those sort of questions. You can do a lot just via your clinical interview, uh, certainly. Uh, the, the assessment uh, instruments, we might not be able to give all of our favorite tests uh, for attention concentration. Uh, you can get a reasonable sense in, in some cases, but I think some of those more subtle ones are, are the ones that are, that are challenging. Um, the, the, the easier ones are the ones that are easier in the clinic, too. Uh, if somebody's clearly demented, uh, you know, or, or you know, if they've had a stroke, it's it's very clear what their deficits are. 
Uh, it's the more subtle cases. Some of the cases of mild cognitive impairment, you might want to have them come in uh, for a more detailed assessment also. Um, if there are subtleties, subtle things you're looking for. Um, you know, the, the longer your test is, the more uh, margin for error there is in a video conference administration. So um, uh, the CVLT is one of my favorite tests, uh, but in the video conference uh, arena, I, I often tend to go for a, a briefer screening test. Uh, apologies to Pearson and Dean Dallas, uh, but um, sometimes your time is just more limited and you might only get a screen. Now, if I've only got a screen, I'm gonna feel less confident in that diagnosis. So if somebody doesn't do well in the HVLT, am I convinced they have mild cognitive impairment based on their history and their other test results? Or do I really wanna have them come in uh, and see me? Uh, and then the question I often get too is, uh, is you know, what do we do with uh, medical legal evaluations? And I have thus far avoided those. Uh, there's kind of a split decision as to how much you can do or should do uh, because of the other uh, risks to um, test security, for example, uh, inadvertent or, you know, in, uh, recording of the, uh, of the uh, interaction that you might not want to have. So that there are a lot of other, other factors that, that go into that. But, and then child evaluations, I think, are, are pose unique challenges too. If there's a behavior problem, telemedicine might not be the way to get the entire evaluation done, but maybe you can get part of it done. Thank you, sorry, I had muted, couldn't find the mute button. Um, a couple of questions about just research in general. What would you anticipate the generalizability of your, of your research findings would be vis-a-vis -vis different cohorts? For example, children, adolescents, adults, with different instruments and different referral questions? Well, certainly if you look at the literature, the literature has been very, very consistent in supporting the same results, basically very, very similar results across um, the diagnosis study to date and across the test um, testing uh, modalities as well. Um, that said, it, you know, and, and I showed the, the, you know, the, the list of a lot of the tests, I'll put it back up, um, that have been looked at in the telemedicine environment and reviewed in the meta-analyses. Uh, it's, it's a decent list, but it's certainly not comprehensive. There are a lot of tests that haven't yet been looked at uh, in this environment. And so we still have a little bit more work to do. Uh, I feel most comfortable with the tests uh, that have been uh, validated. And I'm seeing a warning coming up. <laughs> Is everybody seeing the warning too? <laughs> it's about our time is about to, we have five minutes left, I'm told. So this was uh, the, the Mara uh, review in the elderly. Uh, Brearley's paper also uh, reviewed a bunch of different studies. And this, this was a, a summary of the literature that, that we did uh, a little while ago, uh, listing a lot of the tests that have been done. Uh, there's certainly more than that that could be adapted uh, and administered in this environment. The, the less that the video conference um, interferes with a standard, you know, traditional face-to-face -face, uh, test environment, the better. Um, I think a lot of the risks are environmental, quite honestly, and, and maybe technology related. So there are some unknown features here too. Um, I mentioned earlier, I, I think we're particularly lacking in the executive function assessment arena. Um, if I've got a patient with a uh, suspected, uh, you know, subtle, uh, you know, maybe behavioral variant FTD, frontal temporal dementia, I'm probably gonna wanna see them in person. You can get a great history, you can do a lot of tests, but you might not be able to get the, the key executive function tests and, and to really watch their behaviors as well uh, in that environment. So uh, it's, it's, there's a lot of judgment uh, used uh, and uh, it's a matter of kind of uh, reading the literature and then also trying it out with different uh, different populations. You can learn a lot based on an interview to get started and, and maybe plan a, a briefer uh, screening battery that you're pretty confident you can get done and then maybe test the limits and see if you can expand that from there. Um, I think a lot of neuropsychologists, we may be finding that sometimes briefer batteries might adequately address some of the referral questions we get. We may not need that really uber lengthy battery to address uh, the questions, although we may feel more comfort in it uh, it kind of goes back to being a really good clinician and using your clinical judgment, maybe going on less data. It's not as comfortable, but it, it may be 
adequate in a lot of cases. Thank you. I'm going to ask the last two together just so you can gauge the time. Um, one is, is there an age factor with comfort with video conferencing versus face-to-face? -face? And the other is about how you handle performance validity measures and if there are studies addressing performance validity measures and teleconferencing. Great questions. We've looked at uh, a wide range of ages now. I think our child study was down to age five or six, again, in, in a demyelinating disorders clinic. And then we've tested 90 year olds as well. Uh, there is some uh, effect of, of age. I think some of our older uh, patients are just less tech savvy and, and just sometimes can't figure out the, the technology. So I think that is a genuine uh, limitation. Um, as and what, what the second question what was the second question it's about how how do you handle performance validity measures and about oh, sure. yes yeah not as much research has been done with uh, uh performance validity tests interestingly so um but if if you can do it verbally um if you can show the stimuli visually you can have them read things on the screen or look at things on the screen, depending on the test though, because there are some test security and test confidentiality issues that may come into play. So you, ha you have to be aware of what you're able to share and what, you're, what you shouldn't be sharing also from a test publisher's perspective. And I think we're right on time then. I think we are, and I really, really appreciate it. We all do. It was wonderful information, a lot of very positive, good comments. I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's question. Please put your question in the in the question, not in this chat box, but in a second when it closes, you'll see another place that you can put your question if you'd like for us to get back with you with a response. Again, Dr. Cullum, thank you. Thank all of you who were able to attend today. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thanks for listening. Be safe, everybody.